Hi, and this is the Physics High Podcast. A quick quiz. Do you A, want to be inspired by science communicators? B, want to learn all about science education? C, want guidance on your scientific journey? Well, how about D, all the above? Today, my guest is Helen Giorgio. Now, Helen started her career as a high school teacher, but as she was encountering many concerns in terms of misunderstandings in the classrooms, she decided to do something about it. And she decided to go into educational research, looking at how students can better learn science in the classroom, how to encourage them, and how to avoid misconceptions within the classroom. I think Helen has a lot to share about how to best educate students in the classroom, but not only that, share her journey and show how her science education has led her into different paths. Welcome, Helen. Thanks so much, Paul. Thanks for having me. Tell us a little bit about what you do. Now, I've mentioned that you're an educational researcher, but to a student or let's say a high school teacher, that's a huge field. Uh, do you want to give us a little bit about what your area of expertise, expertise is and uh, what you're researching, maybe particularly what you're doing at the moment? Yeah, definitely. So I actually wasn't aware of this particular career when I was in high school. So my role, I'm Dr. Helen Georgiou, science education lecturer. So my role is essentially the role of an academic and most academics working at universities have kind of split responsibilities between teaching and research. So for my teaching, I actually teach teachers how to teach science. And for my research, as you said, I look into the best ways to help people learn about science. So some of the particular approaches I take, we can sort of think of them as either psychologically based approaches and sociologically based approaches. So uh, psychology is a study into the way that people think. And so when I design research based on this kind of paradigm, I'm looking at like comparing two groups and maybe having one group uh, do one, you know, sort of particular learning, have one particular learning experience, and then the other group have another, and then measure uh, what the outcomes of, of those are and compare them against each other. And I did that quite early on in my research, and I suppose to me it sort of raised a lot more questions than, than answers. So it was sort of like why? Why were students finding this particular thing difficult or even like why do we teach this thing in this particular way and for that I needed something else so when I sort of looked at you know the different sort of frameworks trying to sort of find answers I thought that there were some really interesting ideas from sociology sociology is the study of uh, you know sort of society and culture and the most powerful thing I found about sociology was that it aims to make things about society and culture visible. So when I looked at physics, physics is like a culture, science is like a culture, it has its own language, it has its own assumptions, it has its own you know, epistemology and ontology. So that's the way um, that knowledge progresses and the characteristics of knowledge. And so it made sense that this was going to be sort of a powerful way to understand um, physics and some of the issues that students were having as they were learning physics and science. I saw a brief interview that you did a number of years ago where you were specifically talking about uh, the misunderstandings that you encountered while you were in the classroom. What sort of misunderstandings were you encountering? Were they related to thermodynamics? I know that your PhD research concentrated on thermodynamics, but were there other areas that was like a constant loggerheads for your students? Yeah, and I think any student or teacher of physics um, and even science would be familiar with with some of these. So it's not that every single part of science is difficult. There are actually some things, some concepts that we know are especially difficult. And so a lot of these fall within mechanics, so like forces and motion, 
Uh, so, you know, what makes an object move and how does that object move under the influence of certain forces or, or no forces? Uh, and of course, my area was thermodynamics. So really, I wasn't even looking at the more advanced concepts in thermodynamics. I was looking at the things that were happening around us. So heat transfer and uh, conductivity and the way that we experience things to be you know, hot and cold and why, why that is. So it's a bit like uh, the common misconception. Oh, we sometimes we get cold as if cold sometimes, you know, suggests that it comes into us as opposed to a loss of heat. Is that what you're talking about? That sort of misconception? Right. Yeah. And so, you know, even with the, uh, the sensation that different materials give us. So, you know, in this room, um, I, thermodynamically, everything is at the same temperature. But when I touch different objects, when I touch the metal legs of the chair versus the, you know, the timber of the table, they feel different. Yeah. And the reason for that is because of the um, rate at which those materials actually draw that heat energy from my hands into that, that material. So it's not that they're um, at different temperatures, uh, which is what the, what the misconception is, it's um, this idea of uh, heat, you know, heat conducting, so the heat, the heat transfer. And, you know, without sort of overcoming that misconception, you don't get to explore uh, the characteristics of heat transfer. So what affects how uh, the rate of heat transfer and, um, you know, what the instances of that is in, in our daily lives. Actually, you remind me of a video that Derek Buller did from Veritasium quite a number of years ago now, almost I think 10 years ago, where he went around Paddington showing a metal object, I think some metal tray and a book and asked the questions like, you know, which is the same, which has a different temperature or something to that effect. And I was surprised by how many people just totally didn't understand the process of, you know, the conductivity and so forth. It's a, it's a very common misconception. And uh, a real challenge, I guess, what you're saying is, is how do you break through that misconception? Because clearly there's something wrong in our educational system if so many people still carry those misconceptions into, um, you know, into everyday life. Um, question, you did thermodynamics, um, and just as an aside, um, there's... Until recently, there's not a lot of thermodynamics being done in the physics course. Is that something that uh, you noted in your work? Yes, there is some thermodynamics in the new physics curriculum here in New South Wales. Uh, we might have viewers from overseas, but I have to say it's so small uh, in terms of providing enough depth to be able to cover that. In fact, you know, it's so easy just to skip it if you're running out of time. Is what, What's your thoughts on that? Is, is, is there needs to be more thermodynamics in, in a, a standard physics course? Yeah, well, I suppose uh, that was part of the reason that I chose that particular topic. So if you think about um, forces and motion, you can't argue that we don't cover it in school because we cover it in every stage at primary school and then every stage, you know, at high school. So students visit it and revisit it over and over and over again. But that wasn't the case with um, thermodynamics and energy. So I actually did, you know, sort of campaign to bring it back in to the syllabus and specifically within, within physics. Mm. And so we do have it in the physics syllabus now, but the problem is we don't have it in the junior science syllabus. So I did some research on thermodynamics in the junior science syllabus and the average time that teachers spent on teaching, you know, all of the, the topics, so that's all of the three methods of heat transfer essentially, were three lessons. And that's really not enough time to cover that in any meaningful way. So, um, yeah, it's sort of, you know, that, that issue kind of compounds and it's, it's a really interesting one to think about because it's sort of like when do you introduce those ideas and um, how do you make them more complicated and at what point do you in increase the abstraction and, you know, what's appropriate for what, uh, for what level? That's right. Yeah, I mean, you can't necessarily talk about uh, conduction and convection without referring to particle theory. And, you know, if you're trying to do that in the junior years, well, that's, uh, you know, conceptually quite a challenge to do that. So uh, yeah. where do you introduce it? But then again, the other question is, is, well, if you introduce more time to those sort of key concepts, 
uh, like we do with motion and forces. Uh, something's got to give, something's got to go because there's already a lot in a curriculum. And I imagine that's true for most curricula around the world. It is very, uh, very dense. Um, any, any ideas about your thoughts about like how we uh, come, you know, solve that? Yeah, well, it's something that I'm really interested in, like having had experience and sort of writing um, or being involved in the syllabus, at least in, in New South Wales. Um, and sort of going back to what I mentioned earlier with the ideas from sociology, one of the most powerful ideas, I think, uh, was from a, a sociologist called Bernstein, who identified that actually when you're creating curricula, you're drawing from different fields. So the field of production, which is like physics, which is where physicists are doing their work and where they're advancing knowledge, is different from the, the field of um, what, what he calls recontextualization, which is turning that knowledge into the curriculum. Mm. And then you've got another step where you, you change that knowledge, you transform that knowledge again into the field of what he calls the field of reproduction, which is what happens in the classroom. And at each of those stages, there are really critical decisions being made about what goes in, what goes out, how it's transformed, and what values are imbued in those decisions because they're not value free. And so that's, I think, one important step to start to think about, you know, what we're doing in, in curriculum, just making those decisions really explicit. Um, and the other idea is the idea of physics knowledge in particular has a characteristic structure. So it has this um, dimension of abstraction which, you know, is pretty obvious to anyone that's studied physics but actually isn't to those that aren't familiar with it. And, of course, what physics aims to do is look at concrete things that are happening, you know, in the world around us and explain things um, using some sort of abstracted model. And so sometimes this is sort of a descriptive model. Um, most of the times it's a kind of mathematical model, but, but that's what's happening. And so when we write curricula, we're thinking about, well, we can't use this, you know, super abstracted model. Um, what else are we going to use to try and help, you know, students understand that we're explaining these everyday concrete things using something that's more abstract? Mm. And so sometimes you have to make that up, um, <laughs> like forces, you know, yeah. are made yeah. up. Yeah. Um, and other times, you know, it's, it's something that you can actually do more straightforwardly. Um, but that's a really, you know, complicated space that again uh, we don't often make explicit and and you know this does lead unfortunately to problems like I have heard um, physics students sort of say oh they taught us wrong physics or yeah. you know this isn't the most correct way and of course you know maybe they're right but it's it's about appropriateness at that point um, and a decision has been made and you can criticize the decision but it helps to know you know why it was made yeah yeah yeah, this is not a, I think we can solve between the two of us here, but it, 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 yeah. your, our discussion here runs a very similar theme that I've had with Jeff Weiner from CERN, from Geraint Lewis. Again, the idea, I mean, ties in with, you didn't use the term, but you're clearly talking about it, is how we use models to uh, explain concepts. And those models have value to a certain degree, uh, but they are by their very nature limited. And so, yeah, students think, oh, I was taught wrong. No, you were taught a model that is appropriate. It has limitations, but, you know, there's more to it. I mean, force as being as a uh, gravity as a force is a good example, of course. Uh, Newton works great for rockets, but not great for the, mo uh, the motion of Mercury, for example. So, yeah. yeah. Um, and But they find that hard. And, you know, Grant said to me already, you know, he's finding students constantly going battling him and saying, but what I learned was wrong at school. And they said, well, yeah, no, you know, that sort of concept. So a slight change of tack here, um, more about you, actually. So I want to ask you, um, how did you get into science? What was the thing that made you take this road on science education? Yeah, well, it's, it is, uh, I think, a different story to most, uh, you know, most people that sort of end up in science-related careers because... There were a lot of um, accidents and unintentional decisions along the way. So for me, I'd always loved science. So I did love science as a child. I played with my 
you know, magnifying glasses and trying to burn little bits of paper. And I loved looking up at the sky. And of course, I studied science at school. And when I went to university, I knew I wanted to start, uh, study science there. So university was a bit strange for me because I just didn't know which way to go. So I actually took all three of the main sciences, biology, chemistry, and physics. And I knew that I loved biology. I thought I'd go the way of biology. But because I couldn't take physics in high school, I thought I should at least give, give it a go. And what happened was that actually I ended up preferring physics much more compared to, you know, to biology. And that was a real shock to me because I was convinced that biology was, you know, where my passion, my passion was. So lesson number one, <laughs> your passions are not always um, set in stone. And so then, of course, I, you know, at kind of thinking about it from a practical point of view and with some, you know, very helpful or unhelpful parental input, whichever way you want to look at it, I also took a business degree at the same time as my science degree. Um, so, you know, not to let any of my ATAR points go to, go to waste. Um, but at the end of that, I sort of had finished a year early and um, didn't like the business and still liked the science and I thought I'll do a PhD, but I want to travel first. And because I had that year up my sleeve, I thought I'll, I'll do a diploma of education. So um, that was another surprise because I realised when I did that year of um, my, to, to become accredited and accredited teacher, high school teacher, I found that I loved it. Like I loved talking about science. I loved students. I loved just being, you know, in the classroom. And so I got to work you know, as a teacher for a number of years, I went overseas and, but the idea of that, I'd always planned to go back to university and do my PhD was there. So I thought, all right, well, I've got to go back and, you know, go back and do this. Um, but in the end, my heart wasn't really in it. So it was just sort of by chance that I found this research group at the University of Sydney that was in the School of Physics. So my PhD would still be in physics, but actually the research was focused on physics education. So all of those experiences that I had, you know, working as a high school teacher, I could, like, I could actually draw from them to conduct the research into, into physics education, which is, which is what I did. Mm. Uh, you're not the only one. I can share your oh. experience. I did three of the sciences at high school. I left thinking I wanted to become a doctor. I did an anatomy and a physiology degree. Um, I thought I might as well do education. Oh, you need to have a second subject apart from biology. Well, you've got a couple of physics subjects. Do a few extras. Well, hello and behold, physics education is my complete passion now. I mean, I still love biology, but physics is the thing. So I, I share that journey. I'm not into educational research, but uh, yeah, but uh, you're not the only one. But uh, and I think I think the message here for students listening is that. You know, uh, don't worry if you haven't got your uh, heart set on a particular career at the end of year 12 or you're not sure what you're doing, you might find many paths opening much later and you'll find, what, you know, your, where your passions lie. And I think that's a good thing um, that, you know, don't get hung up about, uh, oh, I don't know what I'm going to do when I finish year 12. It's okay. It'll work out. You'll find your passion. You'll find what you're good at. Now, one of your roles in some, some ways is encouraging not only science educators, but of course you yourself as well, about communicating science effectively. I think um, uh, we need effective science communicators in society. What are your thoughts about how important science communication is in society? Uh, have you got any thoughts about um, how to improve science communication within, within the general society? Yeah, and I think probably my thoughts about this have changed a little bit. So, you know, initially I thought it was just a matter of like getting out there and telling people about the science. That was about the science. And now I guess I, I see the people more um, in, you know, in that equation. So I think there are a few things. So with science communication, I think, you know, the first thing I want to acknowledge is just how much respect I have and admiration I have for people that are in that role of 
educating others in, you know, whatever that might look like because it really is, when you think about it, like a really selfless and altruistic thing to do, to want to help people sort of, um, you know, learn and develop and grow and, and to share what you have gained from that. So, you know, your feelings of being, you know, satisfied and excited and passionate, like to want to share that with others. I think that's amazing. So the other thing is that science communication takes so many different forms. So it's weird for me because I sort of thought that's not something that I'd ever go into because it's something that requires someone really extroverted and someone, you know, that's really great on camera or, you know, in those sort of media um, situations. And certainly, you know, some of the most well-known science communicators are, you know, people like Derek from Veritasium or Brian Cox, or, um, Neil deGrasse Tyson. So those, you know, people that are superstars, but they're certainly not the only type of science communi- communicator. You know, you've got people that are writing science articles. You've got people that are working in science museums. You've got people like me who are educating educators. You've got actual teachers. Um, so all of those are just different versions of the same, you know, type of job. And I would say that that's true for any other position in science as well. Um, you have that opportunity to really play to your own strengths. So whether that is being extroverted or whether that's being analytical or whether that's about reading or writing, um, you know, pretty much all of the different jobs you you could think about have those different versions, um, you know, where each of those strengths is, is the focus. So that's, I think that that's really important with um, science communication because you just need all of those people working together because one can't exist, you know, in a vacuum to achieve all of the aims of, of science communication. Um, and, yeah, just to finish up where I started off, just that science communication now has a really big responsibility because we're tackling some really, really big issues like um, global warming and you know, the vaccines now with the, you know, the pandemic on our minds. And those sorts of issues are not solved simply by telling people science. It's much more, you know, complicated than that. So there's a responsibility for us and anyone that's communicating science to really, you know, think about that and and change and develop um, so that we can, you know, achieve our, our goals. How would you go about doing that? I guess it's the acknowledgement that it's not just about the science. So, you know, we know from a lot of sociological research that just telling people that these are scientific facts does not get them to change their minds. And so I suppose your role then becomes something more than a science communicator. And I, I suppose if you're in that role, you have to take on that responsibility. So what does make people change their minds and how do I engage with them? And can I change so that, you know, maybe I don't see any results, but also maybe I don't, you know, completely kind of turn this person off from science. Mm. Maybe you have a, stu- a, a, a person who has this problem in terms of, a misunderstanding or whatever, it's often they've got a, a very much of a, a vested interest in their worldview. And if you challenging that actually challenges their worldview, at least in their minds, they're going to be resistant to that. I wonder whether the solution there is not so much just telling the science, but it's about establishing a relationship with that person to actually be able to somehow in a relational sort of way uh, that you can sort of disassociate the science from necessarily the the world view. Um, it's not something that comes like this, like you said, some telling, but you can break things down. If they understand that you're not there to destroy their castle, destroy their worldview, they may be open more to hearing out of the science and the reasonings behind it and possibly suggest how it may not necessarily undermine their worldview. Yeah, I suppose that you have lost them when they shut off. So, you know, one of the things that maybe the only thing that you can aim to do is to keep them open to thinking about it, 
more. So plant those little ideas that they themselves can work through and, you know, hope that later on that that leads to something a bit more constructive for them. I'm going to change the tack a little bit again. And I'm, you're speaking to a high school student who's supposed to be thinking of a career in science or at least thinking of a science degree and going forward. Uh, what advice would you want to give them? Yeah, I suppose like the first thing is if you like it, go for it. Because like I said, there's going to be a place for you, you know, somewhere in science. Maybe it's not the, uh, you know, the first, the, the thing that you think about when you think about a scientist. So the, you know, the typical scientific sort of, you know, uh, job. But um, there are so many different things that scientists do, including some very social things like consulting and policy and all of those. So um, definitely, you know, if you like it, there's going to be a place for you um, somewhere if you keep your mind, you know, your mind open. And I suppose even those students that aren't thinking about science, um, the, the same applies that it's it's about so many different things. So there's always going to be a place for, for someone. And even those people that sort of get into science and then, you know, choose to do something else, what you're taking away is actually a really kind of rich depth of knowledge in that area that is going to be useful in, in another area. Um, in another context. Actually, it's interesting that you say that. Um, uh, many years ago, I went to a national uh, conference run by ASA, uh, which is the, uh, uh, the research uh, organisation, educational research organisation. And one side back was the, the importance of that the science education that you do at university can actually skill you up for business and financial uh, careers because you develop skills within the science degree that are very much in demand in other industries. The ability of analytical thinking, critical thinking, and the creative uh, thinking. So, yeah, absolutely. You know, just because you do a science degree doesn't mean you have to go in science. You might find that your skill set that you develop actually takes you a lot of different places that actually may not necessarily be directly to, to science, as well as deepen your understanding with you know, uh, the science content that, you le- that you've learned. Yeah, so, absolutely. Yeah, that's, that's, that's excellent. All right, my last question is a much lighter question, and I think I've already prepared you for it. So uh, I'm going to give you an opportunity to share something about what you are currently um, interested in or even nerding about. I guess the, fra- the idea is, is that when you're in mixed company, it's something that you love talking about and love sharing. What do you have to share with us? Well, to be honest, mine is still science because <laughs> I see science in everything. But I suppose for me, what I'm doing is I'm actually rediscovering things. So I've got two children and the eldest is six and the youngest is two. And they're just at that stage now where they're exploring and they're asking questions. And I have just, I've got this renewed sort of um, just a, excitement for like how things work and why things are you know the way that they are and um the other day I was actually um we're actually we've got this uh, bin this kitchen bin which is uh, an automatic it's got an automatic lid and so the lid um there's an infrared light and sensor on there so it can sense when objects are, are above it and I went to uh, tip in the contents of a chopping board I've got this black chopping board and so I'm holding this black chopping board above the the bin and the bin lid's not opening and I'm thinking there's something something going on here and like of course you know had I been anyone else I would have just sort of dismissed it as a weird quirk of like you know the black object doesn't work but I just think it's so exciting that you know I'm in a position where I can say but why why does that happen um, and of course, it doesn't, you know, it's not really um, too many steps uh, ahead to, um, to appreciate that black things absorb all, you know, frequencies, wavelengths of light. And so the sensor works by emitting this infrared signal and then bouncing off the, the object, um, which of course it can't do if the object is black because it's being absorbed. And there are just a million of these things that are happening every day that I think 
you're just so empowered if you have that kind of scientific knowledge to be able to know that there's an answer, that there's a, you know, explanation and that you could find what that is. Um, so, yeah, so I think that's, um, you know, that was, that was just one little thing um, that, that I noticed and that I thought was, was really cool. And you can test this out yourself. You might not have a bin, but you could um, use your remote control or your television, which is um, often infrared. It's got an infrared um, signal at the end, uh, and you can place it underneath your camera phone and you'll be able to see that kind of light coming coming off it, which is pretty cool. So what you're saying is really you're outdoing your six-year-old son or son or daughter, I'm not sure, um, with why? Why is that happening? Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's no end. It just keeps going and going and going, um, which, yeah, which I think is just, just amazing. Fantastic. <laughs> That's cool. Well, that was a great chat, Helen, um, and um, I really appreciate your time. Uh, it's really been interesting hearing your views, particularly in terms of your educational research, and I'm keen to hear what your uh, latest papers are. How's that paper going? I, I know that I was a participant in that study. How's that going? Or maybe just fill us a little bit in what that particular paper was all about and maybe uh, when we can possibly read it. Yeah, so we are currently working on the idea of creativity in physics, uh, which is really exciting. And so, you know, there is actually the misconception that physics isn't very creative at all. And what we're trying to sort of um, explain is that actually physics is creative. It's just a different kind of creativity. And so those three fields or levels that I spoke to you um, about previously, like the field of production, the field of recontextualization and um, reproduction, we're actually looking at what creativity looks like in those different fields. So what does it look like in physics, um, you know, where, where the research is happening and where knowledge is being advanced? And what does it look like in, in school? So what does cre being creative in physics um, actually mean at school? And so those papers are under review now. Um, and so hopefully we've got some delays because of um, 2020, but hopefully we'll have some publications um, coming out very soon. Thank you again for your time. And I hope I have an opportunity again to speak on other matters uh, at some stage in the future. And certainly on a, you know, uh, when I bump into you, whether it's at the university or when your paper is out and we can discuss the, the, the results from there. But uh, again, thank you for your time, Helen. And uh, I hope you continue in success uh, with your academic research. And if you are interested in looking at academic research in terms of education, please uh, look up Helen Georgia. You'll find her information on the University of Wollongong website, as well as some links to some of the research she has already completed. Thanks again. Take care. Thanks so much, Paul. Thanks for having me. Pleasure. Well, I hope you enjoyed this episode. Please subscribe to get notifications of up and coming interviews as well as my other physics content. My name is Paul from Physics High. Till next time.